the let the Lord will touch Barbara, my wife. Okay, keep her in prayer. You can open up your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter seventeen, verse eleven to nineteen. Verse eleven to nineteen. The book of Luke, chapter seventeen, verse eleven to nineteen. And the title of the message, I'm going to finish it off today, but the title of the message today is, Where Are the Nine? Where Are the Nine? So the book of Luke, chapter 17. Verse 11 to 19. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village. There met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest." And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God, and fell down at his face, at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed, that were are the nine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you praise, I give you honor, I give you glory. Lord, I ask that you just help me, Lord, to deliver this message. If there be anyone here today, Lord, that they're not saved, Lord, that you save them, Lord. That you open up, Lord, their minds and their hearts. Save them, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. Amen. First of all, I just want to start off with, first of all, there, there's 10 lepers, okay? 10 lepers, and uh, they get healed. They get healed. And way back then, if you were sick like that, you could not hang around with people because you, you would affect them, okay? You would affect them. But the Bible tells you and I that only one came back, fell down in his feet, and he was worshiping God, and he was thankful. You don't hear about the other, none of the other ones after that. But this one was thankful. And that's one thing that you and I need to remember constantly, that you and I need to be thankful. You and I, we li we're living in the last days. The Bible tells you and I that we're going to be living in perilous times. It says that we're going to be living in times when people are unthankful. And I see that. I see that. I see parents working two jobs, minding their kids $200 tennies, $300 tennies, $1,000 tennies, $2,000 tennies, buying them the latest fold, $800, buying them the, the latest gadgets, and still unthankful. Parents practically killing themselves, but they're still unthankful. In my day, it wasn't like that. It was bicycles, okay? But they're unthankful. You and I, we live and a generation that's unthankful. And you and I need to remember that we need to be thankful for what the Lord did for us. He set us free. Praise God that you and I are not bound by alcohol anymore. Praise God. I haven't drank alcohol for 40 some years. I haven't smoked weed for 40 some years. Praise God. I haven't cursed for I don't know how many years. I don't speak French no more. Even if I hit my thumb with a hammer, praise God. I don't check out women anymore, praise God, amen, for many, many years, many, many years. And I don't check out the opposite. I don't check out guys either. I, I'm not a transgender, okay? The Bible tells you and I God made man and he made ladies, okay? Praise God, I'm not looking at dirty programs. Praise God. I've been, I, I don't run around with fear. I don't run, run around with insecurity. You know why? Because I've been set free by the power of Jesus Christ. 
I have no, I have, I am not having an adulterous affair. I am not shacking up with a lady. I'm living clean and, I, and I'm being faithful to my wife. And you brothers here too, you need to live a clean life and don't go screwing around with other women. And you, you hear that brothers? And you sisters here too. I mean, we could be in the church. I've been in the church where you wouldn't even suspect it, but there's times that I, I have sat down with people and talked to them, and I know there's something wrong there. I know there's something, but I can't pinpoint it. But if I was closer to God, I could say, thus says the Lord, you need to stop fooling around. You know? But years later, I find out that they were, even people on the platform, See, you, you know, we, we have to have the talk. You know, we, we, I, I know a lot of people that talk big. I even know pastors, man, they talk big. They talk elegant, but guess what? They don't walk the talk. You know, one time I went to a meeting, and there was this guy, real calm, didn't move the people, did not move the people whatsoever. He was boring. He was a boring preacher. I'm going to try not to be boring today, okay? He was a boring preacher. Everybody looked like they were going to fall asleep. And then a young preacher went up there. Man, he just started. Everybody jumped up. They were doing the Holy Ghost jump. It looked like the girls see Michael Jackson like they were going to faint. But you know what? He was a dirty dog. He was a young man, probably early 20s, but I see him checking out my wife. And, and that young man, I was looking at that preacher. His wife just had a baby. He was a dirty preacher. He was a pervert. Okay, but you, but he, he, was, he was talking, but he wasn't walking the walk. So we have to not only talk it, but we got to walk it. Are you walking it? I told somebody I was going to let it go today. Okay. I look at one of, the, one of the ten, one of the nine, and you know what took him out? His job took him out. If any job takes you away from church, you don't need that job. You could say, I need to make a living. The devil will give you every excuse in the world to, take, to have a job take you out of church. He will tell you that jobs are more important than your relationship with God. You got to work for your family. You got to support your family, but you got to be in church. Let me tell you, said, we're living in the last days. They say in the year 2035, China is going to dominate the world. In 2035. You and I are going to, you and watch, you and I are going to see it. Taiwan is going to be invaded by the CCP, by China. We're going to see it, okay? And guess what? Nobody's going to do anything to help them. You know why? Because everybody gave Hong Kong all these promises. If the Chinese try to invade you, CCP, we're going to help you. Nobody helped them. They only helped them with lip service. But they didn't send no military to go help them. Not even the United States helped them. Look at Afghanistan. You was pulled down. All those young girls are being sold as slaves down. Sex trafficking. Okay, look at, in 2035, China's going to dominate the world. That's going to affect us. We're not going to be living the way we live right now. All the things that we want to buy and eat, it, everything's going to change. Everything's going to change. Everything. Okay. Everything's going to change. Let me tell you a story about a 25-year-old man. When he was 14 years old, he got saved. He got saved and he was on fire for God. He even worked at Walmart. He wanted a job. He needed a job. Our spiritual life is more important. He needed a job. Why? Because he wanted cash in his pockets. 
He wanted cash. He wanted money in his pocket. He wanted to buy a car. But during that time, he's 14 years old, they're having a good time in church. Having a good time in church, God's moving in the church, moving. People are getting saved. There's a lot of people that have walked in here, and our church would be really big, but guess what? They're church hoppers. They go visit all these other churches. They stay in this church one month, go in that church one month, go in that church another month, go in that church another month. They don't, they don't let their roots grow. Now, I can understand this. You move to another city, you got to find a, another church. You go to a school, you find another church. But don't go and make those pastors miserable in those other churches because you go there for a month, they're all happy and excited. They say, man, God's moving in the church, and then you're gone. You're a church hopper. Don't be, I don't, don't be a church hopper. If you go to church, stay there and let your roots grow. But can you imagine if all the people would have stood here? This Sunday, they're at this church. Next Sunday, they're going to be another church. Next Sunday, they're going to be another church. They're bunny hoppers. Don't be a bunny hopper. And don't go get a tattoo that says bunny hopper. So guess what? All of a sudden, this guy's 15 years old, having a good time in church. God, God sets up a place where you and I can come and we could get, get challenged. We could get our lives changed. God do a miracle inside our life. We won't, be, we won't be the same people anymore. But guess what? Somebody offered him $10 a week. That was a lot of money in 1954. A lot of money in 1954. But God wanted that man to continue to keep on coming to church because this is where we get fed. This is where we worship God. When you and I come to church, clap your hands, move your fingers, jump, do something. Then he got another job. He started working at the gas station. And the guys would come around. The guys would come around. They weren't saved. And they would always ask. If they weren't even in friends, they would tell him, hey, come on, man. We're going to go see a movie. We're going to go see a movie. This went on for weeks and days and months. He never thought he would. But guess what happened? One day he went to the movies. And he didn't come back to church for 10 years. Took him out just like that. The movies took him out. That's the same thing with you and I, too, is we don't want the devil to take you and I out. Just like that. Every now and then I go to churches that I preach, and I, I, I ask the pastor, hey, where's, what's his name? Where's, what's her name? Oh, she's shacking up with a guy right now. Going to college. Living in a house and acting like they're married, but they're not ever, even married. But they're shacking up and they're being intimate. Well, they should not be intimate because they're not married. Seen some good, promising people in churches. Smart people. Hey, where's what's her? Oh, she got herself a boyfriend. Now she's shacking up at that apartment over there, acting like a married lady. Oh, he's over there shacking up. I told him I'm going to preach it today. <laughs> the only time we should shack up is when we get married. Oh, that was a weak one. And he didn't come back to church for 10, day, 10 years later. I wonder when those young adults are going to come back to church. That's what happened to one of them. And then the military. If you go to the military, you don't have to fall away from God. And if any military people come in here, you and I need to get a hold of them. Get a hold of them. Why? Because there's a lot of influences out there. There's a, who's influencing you? When I need to be incarcerated, I would like to see the magazine, the encyclopedias, and look at Al Capone. 
I would like to look at Al Capone. I would look, like to look at the Elliot Ness, the people that were against the during the prohibition, when it was against the law to drink alcohol. I wanted to be like Al Capone. I'm telling you the truth. Did you know that Al Capone had a scar right here in his face? Did you know that? Say yes if you don't. And you know what? One time when I was incarcerated, I was at battle shop, and I wanted to be like Al Capone. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to get a sorry gun and make a scar right there. Why? Because I want, because that's how much Al Capone influenced my life. Who was influencing you? Who's influencing you? Who's influencing you? You know what? The greatest influences should be the people that are in the house of God. We need, and then if there's nobody here to, you know, Man, when I went to church, I would be influenced by the brothers there. I go, man, check out that brother. Man, he wears a he wears a three piece suit with a tie. I would too, but I need to lose some weight. I told you, okay. <laughs> Don't look over there. Look at me. But you know what? But who's influencing you? We need to let God influence our lives. I remember when I was overseas, uh, executive officer, Lieutenant Litch, I still remember to him to this day. He was a very bad, but guess what? He was faithful to his wife. All, I wasn't married then, but all the guys that were married, everybody fooled around. Everybody had, a, everybody had an, an affair in Taiwan. Everybody had an affair in Korea. Everybody had an affair in Hong Kong and in Tokyo. Everybody had an affair in Singapore. Everybody had an affair in the Philippines. I'm not talking about one affair. I'm talking about male whores. Military, I'm t I was in the military, okay? And they'll be riding their wives. We'd be drinking, taking drugs, smoking weed, acting like some crazy wild men. men. But Lieutenant Lynch, he didn't go to the clubs with us. He did not go to the clubs and dance with us. He did not go to the clubs with us. He did not go to the dances with us. Lieutenant Lynch kept away from us, but there was something different about him. You know what he was? He was a born-again Christian, and he was living right for God. There was about, what, maybe 5,000 of us, and he stood out, Lieutenant Lynch. To this day, I still remember him, but he didn't influence us. But we need to influence people. And then there's some people that go to the military and it doesn't influence them. There's a story about a guy, he was saved, living for God. He flew back to Guam, but the plane disappeared. And they never found him, but he was right on with God. He lived clean for the Lord. And then the Bible tells you that there's one man that he got married. And he said, I have a new wife. I can't come. It could go vice versa. But let me tell you something. It could be a husband or a wife. One of these nine, every time he comes home from something at church, that his wife starts complaining. See, we could be here, but if your husband's here working at the church and then he goes home and he starts complaining, you know, you were too long at the church. Or you tell your wife, you know, you were too long at the church. You know, you can't go to church. Besides, they ain't even paying you. It's all volunteer work here. It's all volunteer. You forget, you forget your wife was a crazy lady. You forget your husband was a crazy man. We start complaining. Raising hell. I mean, 
Every husband here is obligated to take care of their wife, though. You got to take care of your wife. You got to treat her nice. Every wife here, you're obligated. You got to take care of your husband. I remember when my mother got saved, she would do everything she had to do before she went to church. That way my father would not complain. Take care of your husband. Take care of your wife. Don't treat your wife like a stormtrooper. Don't treat her like a bulldog. She ain't no bulldog. But when they take you totally away from God, they are wrong. And you are wrong for letting them take you away from the things of God. Did you hear that? You are wrong. If I try to take things away for Barbara for the things of God, she, I know she would stand up to me and say, no, I'm going. Let me tell you something too. If you're scared of your husband and you're scared of your wife, you're living in an abusive relationship. I asked my wife yesterday, are you scared of me? She goes, no, I'm not scared of you. I used to be scared of you years ago, but I'm not scared of you no more. Some wives, they can't say nothing because they feel if they say the wrong thing that their husband's going to slam dunk them down. So they just keep it zipped. So did you hear what I said? If you're scared of your husband or you're scared of your wife, you are living in an abusive background. That's abuse. I don't... We don't believe in boyfriend and girlfriend here, okay? If you're going to be with somebody, be with somebody that you're going to marry, okay? Don't go break nobody's heart. Don't be the heartbreaker. When I was growing up, my friends, they had a group called the Heartbreakers. They weren't breaking girls' hearts. Girls were breaking their hearts. It's not right for your mate to take away from the things of God. And like I said too, if you let them, you're wrong too. Another thing that took these guys out was the entertainment. They got into the party life. In the book of Luke chapter 15, man, here he goes. He goes to Las Vegas. Yeah. Man, he had a lot. Isn't it funny when you have money, you got friends? When that's how the world was when I was there. When you got money, you got friends. When you got a car, you got friends. But when you don't got no money, you don't got no car, you don't got no friends at all. But what happened to this prodigal? He started looking at Fresno. He said, man, I could party in Fresno. I could have a good time in Fresno. He left his dad and he went to the party life. He was a prodigal. Why was he a prodigal? He was a prodigal because his dad was a pastor. He fell away from the things of God. I remember one time a girl came in here and I just felt that God's hand was upon her. I just felt something on her. And later I, I, I felt an urgency. There was something on her. And guess what? Her dad was a pastor of a church in Idaho. And she got saved here. She worked in a little more air station on the jets, but now they shipped her out somewhere else. But she gave her life to God. And I don't know if she ever spoke in tongues, but when she came here, she just started crying and she was, Oh, Yande. I bet you she wrote her dad and mama letter, and I bet you they were happy and excited because at one time she was lost, but she was found. He got lost. 
He was in the narrow way, but he went to the broad way. In the broad way, you can do whatever you want to do. You can do everything you want. You can, you can live the life you want to live. You can, you can whatever in the broad way. But it leads to hell. But, the, but it says, but narrow is a way that leads to life. Let me tell you something. There is a hell. And most of you will go to hell if you were to die right now. I'm telling you the truth. Especially the young adults we have here in the church. You're going to go to hell. If you were to die right now, you would go straight to hell. Why? Because of your sin that you do. And because you're not serving God. There's no compromise in God. Either you're serving God or you're not serving God. There's... That's what it is. There's no in between. Well, I'll give my life tomorrow. No. You go to hell and burn for all eternity. Can you imagine? It's all eternity. There is no way you're going to get out of hell. I know people that are in hell right now. Tomorrow is not promised to no man. I know there's a lot of people say there ain't no hell. But there is a hell. So what did he do? He went to the entertainment. You could party. And then that took him out. And then there's the recreation. Probably left. He went fishing. He went hunting. He went to the race games. He went to the gambling casinos. Everybody says all the church, all, all the church wants is all your money. No, they don't. 7-Eleven wants your money. Winkle wants your money. Walmart wants it. The gambling casinos want your money. They want your money. The church doesn't want your pg and &E wants your money. They have so many lawsuits on them. They need it. They need it. Is there anything wrong doing those things, there is nothing wrong doing those things. I go fishing. My wife was just talking to her brother, and he said he was his boss landing, and he told her he went fishing. I go, what did he catch? She asked him, what did you catch? Nothing. <laughs> Too much seaweed over there. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Next week, guess what? Next week, I'm going on vacation for two weeks. Straight, straight. Praise God. There's nothing wrong with vacation. Pastor Tim was just on vacation for two weeks. In Hawaii. Well, praise God. Well, I'm going on vacation for two weeks. I'm going to go buy me a used truck. I'm going to go buy me an old trailer. Strap it on there, and we're going to travel all around for two weeks, me and Barbara. I'm a cedar citizen. Can I do that? <laughs> See, there's men and women here in the Fresno Church. They do recreation, but guess what? They don't let the, They do not let them hinder them from serving God. They're still here. Number six. Imagine one of those brothers let his family and friend keep him away from God. He probably went up and God cleansed and came back. Said, man, look at what God did to me. Look at what God done for me. Has he, have you ever seen people get saved and they go to their family and their friends? And then all of a sudden they say, hey, don't be a fanatic. I'm a fanatic. I'm sold out. If, I'm a, if you want to call me a fanatic, call me a fanatic. But they'll call us fanatics. You are a fanatic. They'll invite you to their outing so they can keep you away from church. They'll invite you over and offer a New York steak and a ribeye. 
Never offered you that before. Before it was just a hamburger. Now New York steak, now it's a ribeye. Do you know what will take you away from God quicker than anybody else? So-called Christian families and friends. When somebody starts influencing you to stay away from the house of God, it's good to kind of keep away. The same thing happened to all the other nine. Your family and friends want you to be good, but not too good. I know this girl, she was wild. She got saved. Her whole life was radically changed. Her mother hated it. And she went back out into the world. Have you ever noticed that public schools, meetings, sports, they always do their things when it's church night, Wednesdays or Fridays, or even Sundays? It's not by coincidence they got a mission. You know what that mission is? That mission is to keep you away from church. When your family invites you over from out of town, I don't understand that. When your family invites you, when your family comes from out of town, invite them to church. Maybe they'll get saved. Don't stay home with them. Bring them to church. You know what our first obligation is? Our first obligation is serving Jesus. Number seven, cults. Cults. Not a cult. I'm talking about cults. And then Beyonce. Is that how you say her name? I really don't care. Beyonce. For, for you Mexicanos, Beyonce. Beyonce, she has her church. Did you know that? Beyonce cult. I remember our last presidential administration, Obama, his wife, what's her name again? Michelle. Michelle said that Beyonce was a good influence to the young generation. And, but have you ever seen Beyonce? When she's on the floor and she gets, you know it's not even her now. Look at her eyes. Look at her, how she starts moving, and it looks like there's a big old snake in her mouth. She's possessed. I'll stop right there for you, Beyonce lovers. <laughs> and then there's a vampire cult. And it goes on and on. That's that control. I don't control nobody's life here. If you ask me something or my wife or people here will say, well, let's see what the Bible says. Not what we say. Number eight, education. They forgot God. Education. You can let education take you out. Or guess what? Or it could work really good for you to be a good witness. I believe in going to college. When I got a service, I want to go back. I want to go to college and Barbara didn't let me. She controlled me. (laughs) She was cold. She was cold. (laughs) She ain't cold no more though. Noah Webster, very educated man. He made the Webster Dictionary. The list goes on and on of people that were very, very educated. 20, 29 of the men that signed the Declaration of Independence, they were seminar graduates, and they say that they were agnostic, but they were, they were believers in Jesus Christ. Ed- education is power. Education is power. I heard this story about this lady. She came from Vietnam. She was in a refugee camp for so many years. But finally she came here to America, went to college, learned English, and she works. She works for the government now. 
And she gets paid a lot of money. Is there anything wrong with getting paid a lot of money? No, there ain't. But she educated herself. Okay. Don't put, I'm closing now. Don't put, don't let education make you forget about God and you put everything behind. Knowledge can help you get a good job. And then when God discouraged, there's too many hypocrites in the church, in the house of God. I tell you who the biggest hypocrite is here is all of us. If you let a hypocrite come between you and God, thank you, just let that hypocrite be closer to God than you are. You know what? They preach too hard in that church. They preach too hard in that church. Everybody here has dirty socks. But not like Vance Corporal Palacios. Man, when I was in Okinawa, there was a Marine right there. His, land, his name was Palacios. Not related to Rosemary. But Lance Corporal Palacios, we were out there in the jungle like for two weeks. First time we ever put up tents, we put up tents. I went inside the tent and, man, his feet stung so bad I slipped outside of the tent. I'll never, you know, some people, you never forget them for the rest of your life. Well, there's some people in Chicago I'll never forget. I haven't forgotten none of the people in Chicago. Well, I'll never forget the way his feet found. Each and every one of us, we fall short here. Each and every one of us, you know. But don't leave the church because a hypocrite. If you go to Walmart right now and they're selling turkeys for $2.50, butterball, Barbara makes her own butterball, amen. She gets that knife, yeah, puts the butter in there. <laughs> You're not going to stop shopping at Walmart, you go to Winkle and they have a sale, you're not, and, and you don't like that teller there, you're going to go down another cashier, right? The same thing too in the church. There's no love in that church. I have no friends in that church. They're not friendly in that church. first church I went to, the pastor, he, he said this, when he went to church, he had no friends. Nobody was his friend. And guess what he did? He made all kinds of friends. I've tried to make friends with pastors and they don't want to be my friends. So that's all right with me. And then there's pastors I try to make friends with and they're my friends. There's people I try to be friends with. They're not my friend. Then there's other people I try to be their friend, and they're my friend. So just be friendly here. Just try to make, just try to make a, a friend. You be friendly if they're not friendly. Don't you want to do your, don't you want to do your best for God? I've got problems. I got faults. I got failures. I fall short. But glory to God, I get up, brush myself off, and I go to God. I'm not a perfect human being. I fall short. But I thank God that God's given me and you the ability to what? Hey, brush ourselves up, get up, and start worshiping him. Where are the nine? Out of ten who were saved and miraculously delivered from their leprosy, only one came back. But I'm asking myself, where am I? Where, where are you right there? Are you, are you and I one of those nine? We need, to make up our, we need to make up our minds and say, you know what, I'm not going to stay away from you, Lord. I'm going to get close to you, Lord. Because I want to be that one that came back and fell down and said, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. Let's every eye close, every head bowed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.